I'll just let you take it away, David. Uh, okay. He's going to tell us about Structs++, Plus Plus, which is a new uh, data library. It's an old library, but... It's mature. A mature library mature, that needs yes. to be more well known. So, Thank you. David. Uh, I'm David Storrs. This talk is about Struct++, Plus Plus, and let me just tell you how thrilled I am to be following the talk that came before me. There's no stress induced by that at all. Uh, okay, so uh, data integrity with structs. I'm going to be talking about struct plus plus. So if I was a, just a little bit smarter, I would have called this data integrity with struct plus plus. But that didn't occur to me until actually it had already been published on the website, and it was a little late. Okay, so first off, why do we care about data integrity? What is data integrity? Okay, so uh, your program consists largely of data and control structures to move it around. A struct is a collection of values that pertain to a certain thing. It's usually a noun, you know, a user, a network message, whatever. Can be a verb, but that's a little weird. A little uncommon, I'll be polite. Uh, these values are expected to meet certain rules. Usually the rules are not specified anywhere except in documentation. They're not part of the code. They're not enforced. Everything cool? Okay. Uh, so a struct has data integrity when all of its field rules are satisfied. So the username is a string, the age is an integer and positive, and all of the internal uh, between fields relationships are satisfied. So if the job title in field in the struct says President of the United States, then the age field must have a uh, number that is greater than 35. Assuming we're measuring in years, and if you want to measure someone's age in days, then that's on you. Uh, okay, so here's some standard racket code that would do this for you. Now, as you can see, this is a lot less impressive because of the way it came up, whatever. Uh, LibreOffice is a lot, is sort of ruining my joke here, but as you can see, this is uh, doing some reflection code and then declaring if, well, you know, I'll just let you review it on your own time. It's, it's all pretty straightforward. You could do that, or you could do this. And this is an example of an actual production usable struct plus plus declaration. Uh, it's, you know, the whole nine with all the various bells and whistles. I'm going to run through each step in it very quickly, and hopefully it's relatively self-evident once I do. The rest of the talk is explaining each individual piece as we go. So we have a USA truck, truck struct to model a truck made in the USA. Uh, it has three fields, make, model, and color. Um, make is either Ford or Ram. Model is either F-150, 1500, or 2500, and they must be strings. Color is either blue, white, or black because there are no other truck colors. Like, no truck has ever been created that is not one of those colors, thankfully, because it makes my system much easier. Uh, make will default to Ford. Color will default to black. We have a check rule that says, OK, make and model, let's examine those together. If the model is F-150, then the make has to be Ford. If it's 1500 or 2500, it has to be Ram. By the way. Raise your hand if everybody knew, if for anybody who knew that Dodge trucks are published under the, are put out there under the RAM. Like, I did not know this when I put this talk together. So apparently I'm a doofus. Uh, okay, we also have a convert for rule that will take one of these structs and turn it into a JSON string. And we have another uh, convert from rule that will take a database row and turn it into one of these structs. So to and from. Okay, having done that real fast, I obviously don't need to do the rest of the talk, but you know, I'm loquacious, so I'll go through it in detail. Uh, this, pro this code will make the programmer sad. All right, this is base racket. We declare our USA struct with our make, model, and color. Okay, we have some documentation saying what the field values must be and what the internal values must be. And then I have several examples here. The first one is fine. But the second one was written by a doofus like me who does not know that Dodge trucks are actually RAM. Uh, 
the next one, the model 1500 got put in as an integer instead of a string because that's kind of a logical way to express numbers, but you know, not doing it here. Uh, the next one says that, oh no, F-150 trucks are not actually published by RAM. And the last one says, oh no, blue is supposed to be a symbol, not a string, because whatever. Uh, all of the ones with fields in red are invalid, but you're not gonna know that at the point of declaration. You're only gonna know that somewhere far, far down the line when your program blows up and you are sad. This code here will make you meh, happier. Each of the fields has a contract that enforces the values you put into it. And you'll notice that uh, struct++ automatically gives you a keyword constructor. And if you follow that keyword constructor, it will do the type checking for you and verify that each of the values you're giving it matches the appropriate uh, field contract. Uh, by the way, a quick note here. With a couple of small edge cases, struct++ is a drop-in replacement for struct. So anywhere that you're declaring a struct in your code, you can probably just do require struct++ plus plus and then, you know, struct++ plus plus name of thing and it'll do all this for you. It'll generate all this for you. And right. This pro code will make the programmer happy. Uh, I am checking each of the fields, just like we did on the last slide, but that slide did not cover, that only covered the field declarations contracts. It did not cover the interrelationships. This one does. This says, take the make and the model, check them to make sure that the make corresponds, the make and the model correspond and do the right thing. And you'll notice that if your uh, struct instantiation uses invalid values, you get an exception that says the make and the model match. Okay, uh, you get various constructors. So you declare your person to be name and age. This is what I just said about drop-in replacements. And if you do this, there's three ways to get one of these things. You can use the keyword constructor, which I would strongly recommend because I put a lot of trouble into making that work. Uh, you can take a hash and turn it into one of these things. Honestly, it doesn't have to be a struct++ plus plus constructor. It can just be any function that takes keywords. Uh, I don't know why you would manually write that, but you could. Uh, and then the third one is you can still use the racket constructor because obviously all of struct++ plus plus compiles down into base racket code, which includes a struct definition. The only problem with that last one is it kind of defeats the whole point. It, you know, it will end up creating invalid structs if you're not careful. Okay, default values. Helping or enabling? It's a debatable question. Uh, this is what we saw before. We still have our contracts, but now the make and the color will default, right? You can see that in the example. You say, okay, it's a truck, it's an F-150, and the system says, oh, well, that means it's a Ford and it's black, because Ford only makes black trucks. I, that's a thing, right? I'm pretty sure that's right. I know trucks good. Uh, okay, field wrappers. These are the construction time wrappers. There's also access wrappers, but those are being pushed off. Uh, so here's a book. It has one field named title. The field must be a string, and it has a wrapper around it, string title case. So had I been a little bit smarter, I would have made this, I would have passed this the little learner which would have been a nice callback, but I didn't. So you can see here, I passed it a lowercase value and then it normalized it to be title case, right? Uh, you might, you could easily do something like have the wrapper be a, you know, the twiddle A function so that the model 1500 will get turned into the string 1500 if you accidentally pass it a uh, number. Dotted accessors. So look at that first line. Remote server send channel, right? What is that? Is it a function with some random name that does something? Or is it an accessor that pulls the server send channel 
field out of a remote struct, or is it a remote, is it a accessor that gets the send channel field from a remote server struct? Well, there's no way to tell by looking at it. So struct plus plus will generate dotted accessors for you. So looking at that bottom line, you know that it is a remote struct. You know that the field name is server send channel and Bob's your uncle. And if we have any gamers in the room, you'll recognize the tagline at the bottom. OK, uh, a lot of times you're going to want to turn a struct. You, you need to move data from one format to another. And so you have your struct. You want to turn it into a JSON string so that you can send it over the wire or so that you can put it in a database or whatever. At the top, I've written out this function in default racket. Uh, we have our struct definition, and then I manually create something, you know, pers person to JSON. There's no contract on this function. Uh, no, not so good. It constructs a hash. It does a whole lot of manual deconstruction on the hash to get it to, on the struct to turn it into a hash so it can get sent to the JS expression to string from the very delightful JSON module. It's been super helpful for me. Alternatively, you could have struct plus plus do this for you. And convert for uh, takes a name for the converter, in this case, JSON. And the converter will accept something that is required to be a person struct. Uh, it has a contract on it. It'll magically turn it into a hash, and then it'll pass the hash to whatever you define in your arguments here. Uh, in this particular case, it will, the function it's being passed to can do a whole lot of mangling on the hash. It can add, subtract, delete, you know, overwrite fields, and then it sends it through a post processor, when it, which in this case is JS expression to string. So you can see at the bottom, here's an example, person to JSON, you give it a person and you get a string back. So works as expected. Okay, well, maybe we want to do a little more than just return the value. Maybe we want to actually do something with it. So here's the same thing as the previous slide, but now instead of returning the string, I'm actually going to write it to a database. And this is as simple as passing it a function, just like we did before, and it writes it to the database. Yeah, that's all there is to it. And you can see that at the bottom, I call the converter function, uh, and then I immediately do a query to pull it back from the database, and yes, we get a JSON string back. This would be a first step on an object relational mapper, uh, which access wrappers would also be a good place to go with this. Whether you want an, access, an ORM or not, that's an open question, matter of preference. I leave it up to you. Maybe you want to go the other way and take arbitrary data and turn it into one of these structs. Here is a convert from function. And ah, no, not what I wanted. OK, good. So what's happening here is we have a function that's going to be automatically generated, db row to person. It takes a vector. It runs it into a match that, in this case, says, OK, it's got to be a, a vector with name and age, and the values that I'm going to use are, for my keyword constructor, are name and age. And you can see the function that it's generating here. So db row to person plus plus, takes a vector, returns a person, goes into a match, uses that to parse it, and then calls it. Okay? Uh, not complicated, but it's a nice convenience. Functional setters and updaters. Uh, you know, God forbid we should do mutation unless we're using the mutate library, which sounds awesome. Uh, so your setter does what you'd expect. You pass it a value, you get a new person struct back with the new value. And your updater gets the current value and uh, returns a new struct that has had that value run through your function, your updater function. Uh, I do want to add a version of this, I think, that will actually receive the struct itself as a second argument so that you could do this based on, uh, you know, based on other data inside the struct, but I haven't written that one yet. 
And there's more. Now, how much would you pay? So I'm not going to go into this too much. Uh, transform lets you turn things into other things in the process of constructing it, at least as another checking. Uh, access wrappers, blah de blah de blah. I'm not even going into reflection, even though, oh my god, that took so much work. But I will leave it all to you to look that up. And finally, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Any questions? Oh, and uh, I did not bring books. Sorry. So. I have a question. I have an answer. Let's see if they match. When you use the word reflection, yes. what version of that are you talking about? I am talking about there is a property on the struct that is added for you, which contains a promise. If you force the promise, you get a struct containing a ton of data that you can introspect based on uh, it contains the names of all the accessors, the functional versions of them, uh, all the rules, information about the rules, lots of other stuff that you could then use to dynamically dissect a struct that you got past and didn't have the exact details of locally. Very nice, but I do like to, I like to mention uh, some research I did with uh, Mitch Wand okay. some years ago. I couldn't even begin to tell you when, <laughs> that where we had a very much more interesting perspective, at least I think so, about reflection. And it was also part of Anurag's dissertation. I'm quite confident that anything I might say up here, you would be able to reply to with, let me tell you about a more interesting version of it. <laughs> hey, thanks for the talk. I'm Tom Micken from here at Northwestern. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you're able to express things like functional dependencies within a struct, uh, a struct plus plus type or a cross, uh, yeah. which can be useful in like laying out your database, for example. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, I actually, uh, I did that up here somewhere. Uh, I remember it was on the default values. I couldn't tell if that was like, yeah. if that's what that was or not. Okay. So if you look at this right here, the make and model match, uh, this is checking a interdependency between the make field and the model field. Okay, gotcha. Yep. Cool, so, right on, thanks, appreciate yep. it. And you can also like transform fields based on these interdependencies and then later rules will see the transformed value. Okay, awesome, thank you. Yep. Now we have an online question. Can you add converters to structs after the structs definition? No. I mean, you could, you could write your own, construct, your own converters manually and then you know, pass them, but they wouldn't, I suppose you could even inject them in. Basically, no. <laughs> So uh, you mentioned at some point that basically you envision this can be plugging everywhere. There's a strike. Mm -hmm. So I wonder. I'm it's curious about the. But yeah. I'm curious about the. What kind of compositionality do you think the current implementation has, or do you mind say about the, some a very brief uh, to, to talk about the how the implementation works? Okay, I raise this question because uh, there's a this kind of composition issue with contract and uh, say solvers, uh, which is related to the talk I gave in the, in the morning. Mm -hmm. I was trying to compose something with the sanity check, uh, say on, or on the structure with a solver AD language and didn't work because the, these checks, they do not recognize uh, the, solver aided framework on top of it. So I think the question you're asking is, after you've declared a struct, can you compose that struct with other structs or? I mean, say you have a, something this semantics that the it's kind of completely different semantics. Mm -hmm. It's not reg regular racket semantics. How would that play out? So, okay. so. Uh, could I rephrase that question as you have some semantics, you have a struct that will represent some part of your program mm -hmm. and the fields in that struct must have certain relationships to one another. Is that a fair restatement of your question? 
Or maybe they will make a play. So basically, we're doing the sanity check, mm -hmm. right? What if we plug in these sanity checks into uh, something that runs the program, not in the way Racket usually runs it? Uh, I'm struggling with this little one. Yeah, it sounds like the question is somewhat abstract, but maybe it would make for a good discussion afterwards. Um, I think the answer is yes, you can do that. Uh, these checks are, come on back. Oh, I guess it doesn't matter. Uh, these checks are all racket codes. So you're running this code in racket, your struct gets created, and it can check whatever is in the environment, plus you can pass in individual fields that are being constructed. So any check that you could do in Racket, you can do in a struct plus plus definition. Yep. Nice. Did you have a question, John? I think two, two very short questions. Um, uh, thank you. I, the, 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 the challenge with something like this always is, right, is getting everybody to use it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that wasn't a question. Um, have, you, uh, have you written a type Racket version of this? I, I feel like it would totally work. Uh, I have not. Okay, actually. replace. I mean, right. Replace your. I, I replace your contracts with types. I mean, it, right. It's all about whether you would. If you're not. Gonna, you know. If you don't use it, then of course you're not going to write it. Um, I, I feel like that would be. That would be cool. Uh, pull request. Very welcome. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> well uh, and, the, and the other question is: Would it be at all entertaining to uh, to put something together that automatically does uh, convert to and then a convert from to make sure that it's the identity? You know, so whenever I, you know, whenever I create a structure, I was like, oh, let's just check and make sure that we convert it to JSON and back again. Oh, look, we got the same thing. Or did we? I mean, that's a trivial thing to put in your of test course. suite. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, but right. Just to, in order to check that your pair of, of, you know, you know, of converters is actually. So, for instance, let's say I add a field, mm -hmm. you know, to, to my structure, but then I forgot to add it to the to the con, to the converter, and I, um, in, in some interesting way, right? Maybe you it, could. You could don't have to this. add it to the converter. I, I understand. It's there automatically. I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. If, sorry, but I I can write arbitrary code in my converter as well. Can I yeah. not? Yeah. So, so this is potentially interesting there. Okay. Whatever or not. All good. Thank okay. you very much. I mean, yes. In your test suite, you could take the convert for function and you know, give it a thing, and then put the result, you know, nest th that inside a convert from, Absolutely. and then check I'm to just, see I'm if just it's... I'm saying, would it be amusing to automate that? Maybe not. Yeah, okay, cool. So, Thank so you. you could, the, the contract system has the ability to randomly generate values that satisfy contracts, so you could have like an option in struct plus plus mm -hmm. that would just sort of throw crap into the converters <laughs> and unconverters and see if it ever found a counter example. That would be an interesting And that could just be like, yeah. but it maybe that's what John is... Maybe. Yeah. 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 If there's interest, I'd be happy to do that. Or again, pull requests in. Welcome. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, maybe we could use the mutation framework for something like that. That would be pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I had a question. Is this something that could be applied to a data validation framework that might be used in web forms? So like form validation, for instance? Could be used for a what framework? Uh, form validation for web application purposes or? Yeah, absolutely. Take the values out of the form. See if you can construct a struct plus plus instance from it. If you can, then you know that all those values are valid according to the rules you defined it with. So, yep. Okay. Which well, actually is a really easy way to do your checking. Like, just create the struct. If it doesn't blow up your program, it worked. So, nice. Yeah. Um, I also didn't have a chance to introduce you, and I noticed that you mentioned that you've written four million words of science fiction and fantasy. Yeah. Would you care to elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, so, I write science fiction and fantasy stories and novels and whatever. And I did an approximate estimate based on what's on my laptop. And it's about 4 million words. Uh, I think my largest work right now is a, a Naruto fanfic quest, uh, which is up on sufficient velocity. And so for those who aren't familiar, which I wasn't, a quest is like a web novel where the readers vote on what they want the protagonist to do in the next chapter. <laughs> and it's sort of a cross between that and a role-playing game because we actually like went and defined mechanics for it, and they were terrible. <laughs> so then after like two years of this, we threw them out and created a whole new set, which worked much better. Uh, and it's called Marked for Death. It is on sufficient velocity. It is not the Steven Seagal movie. Very important to know. Uh, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. Come check it out. It's currently at three million words. I co-write this with a friend of mine who lives in England, which makes for wonderful coordination problems when you're trying to plan things across six time zones. 
Uh, and then I've got a bunch of books up on Amazon and you know other things I've published and whatever. So, yep. do we have any other questions? Um, okay, let's give it up for David.